Having a Gas is the podcast that talks to the great and the good of the creative industries, and in particular finds out what makes great music for film, for TV, for commercials, for dancing to, for cooking to, for f***ing to, and more. Today, I'm having a gas with Paul Kinsella, the straight-talking CCO at Havas Links. Known to his friends as PK, Paul has had quite the journey, and he tells me all about the spark that lit his lifelong pursuit of outstanding creative work, which drew him up the ladder to the top job at Havas Links. Okay. Uh, hello, Paul. Thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure. It's good to be here. Yeah. How is it um, feeling at the moment in the world of healthcare comms at the time of recording? It's 13th of November. Uh, really good, actually. We've been very busy. Um, how, how are we feeling? I think the agency will be feeling a little bit jaded today. We had our internal Academy Awards yesterday. So, oh, yeah. Um, the way that Lynx is set up, we have a model called Pride where it's split into like 11 different agencies mm. and they compete creatively, which we did last night. So, obviously, super important more than ever. So, the purpose of doing it is culture. So that we all get to see each other and it's never been more important than it is now because people are locked at home we're in a second lockdown we've been working incredibly hard uh, it was a great success it was great to see people um so it was our first virtual version of this we did it um over a two-week period and the big ceremony last night where the winners and awards were, were announced so yeah a great success really for the agency and um how did it compare like i'm, gu- I'm guessing normally there'd be, you know, a bunch of money spent on a proper venue and it would be decent. How, how do you make up the difference in value when everyone's at home? It's a great question. So you're right. Yeah, normally we'd be in one of the hotels, black tie event, dinner, lots of free bar, which, you know, goes a long way to make people happy. <laughs> um, the, the main thing we have to consider is we can't do it the same way. You can't do an eight, you know, a five, six hour event on a screen after people working all week. So what we did differently this time is... The teams pitch to our clients um, that the, their, you know, the work uh, and their presentations. We did that last week. Then we had some inspirational talks. We had, you know, people in from Cannes, people in from the network. Gave John and myself gave some presentations to keep that momentum building. But last night, the actual award ceremony. So how do how do we keep it engaging um, with creativity and with energy and effort? So. There was a lot of films, um, a lot of tech checks. So we had to make sure, you know, we're, we're streaming live to 450 people and we have to make sure that that's going to work. So we had that, you know, the theme of the event was you can't mask talent. Um, obviously, with the pandemic and people being locked at home, we used the, the COVID mask. And what, some of the, we made idents where we got staff to record messages and then it was superimposed onto the mask. The mask would be put on their desk or in, in one of the local pubs that we go to. And we brought the office to people's homes. We brought that amusement and we brought the theme through. Um, to add to that, we we had um, celebrity, you know, you can pay like 30 quid, 50 quid for a celebrity to do. So there was some great sort of little surprises for the team. Uh, we had a hugely emotional poem by the famous Tony Walsh that was great. Um, a one-off for the event because um, of licensing, but it was it was superb. And it really captured, he did a great job of capturing the spirit of what we stand for. And it, it went down really well with, with the staff. And then our own host, Neil Martin, who, you know, absolute celebrity in his own right. The way that he, you know, did two hours worth of entertainment and talking and the red thread through it. And a lot of credit to the team behind it and the hard work that goes into it. We have our own in-house um, film production, Studio Six, which I know you're aware of. Um, it was great to see those wheels in motion and how they pulled it all together. Um, and it, like the feedback we've been getting today, it, it's it's been worth every bit of energy. You know, it's the morale boost that we all need right now. It reminded us of what the office looked like. It reminded us of what each other looked like rather than just through you know a screen. So it was good fun. Um, we sent out as well to the teams these you know physical pack that had a, an MS dime for two, a bottle of prosecco, party poppers. All the awards are physical. They're in the offices of the people who won and we recorded it live so they could see it. But we also had AR codes so that you could have your own award and put it on your own mantelpiece and then post on social media. So, you know, like everything we've been finding with COVID, from a creative point of view, it's a blank page, isn't it? It's like new problems, new things to solve. Yeah. So some of the stuff I've heard today is great that it's been as good or better than some of our awards that were there physically. So the effort that we went to and the way that we pulled it together... And that culture that we're, you know, we're desperately trying to not just build but to keep 
it really came through in the feedback we're hearing. Brilliant. And so I couldn't tell, you know, if when you were saying earlier that this was our first virtual event, are we hoping it's going to be the last virtual awards? Yeah, of course. You know, there's nothing better than seeing people um, face to face, but we, we do a lot of event work for our clients, you know, big congresses where there's huge money spent, huge creative opportunity. Um, I don't think we'll see those just like that anymore. You know, there'll be a, a hybrid, in my opinion, where, we'll, you know, we'll bring virtual and the physical world together. And if that's the good thing that comes out of COVID, great, you know, new creative ways of tackling problems. Uh, and to be honest, from a personal point of view, I love the fact that we're not traveling around the world in aeroplanes and polluting the planet and, and, and meaning I'm getting up at five in the morning and sitting in Manchester Airport. Yeah. So, you know, if, if there's ways that we can improve as an industry or as a, as a whole from the back of it, great, let, let, let's go for it. Yeah, I have had a sense all through this year um, that we returned to a way of thinking as a result of COVID that uh, we hadn't done for a long time, which was trying to find opportunity out of crisis because yeah. there's never been a point in our lifetime where we've all been in the same crisis at the same time, uh, globally, locally. And so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I do sympathise with the thinking of, let's see what good we can take out of this. What else do you think is going to come good out of this year? Plenty, to be honest. And I don't want to sound like super positive about things. I need to acknowledge that it's been tough for a lot of people. Mm. Um, but my view on it is it's a reset button. You know, we all work at a million miles an hour and, you know, we're guilty of sometimes doing the same thing, the same solutions, the same problems. It, it's forces into new ways of working. It's forces into new ways of communicating. Like most people in my friendship group at the same age of me have said the same thing about their parents, you know, didn't know how to use Teams or Zoom. We can do that now. It means more face-to-face -face communication, even if you can't get there. Yeah. We, we can check in on each other. Um, you know, we've brought technology to the forefront. It's, it's accelerated things that would have happened anyway, but for me, for, for good reasons. Well, I think there's a, be careful what you wish for was what was coming to my mind when you were saying um, in the previous era, let's call it, um, it would be uh, Manchester Airport, 5am, flying to do whatever. I spoke to Ben Kay for this series and he said, you know, you'd have these round the world trips for what? ultimately amounted to an hour meeting, uh, two hours yeah. of actual productivity. And so that's definitely what we found here is that because you like us, we're all in the north, we're all in Manchester and we get a lot of business from uh, London. And when we were trying to drum up that business, that would be me and Gary spending a fortune on trains going yeah. down and you can spread maybe in London in a 12 hour day, five, six meetings maximum. And now we're having four or five a week just because we've got this technology. And I really hope that we're all uh, grabbing this bull by the horns and, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting out all the unnecessary travel and just coming straight to each other. Yeah, of course. Like my, my life before COVID, so we had, a, I helped oversee the office in London as well. One of the teams I look after is in, in King's Cross, which is great for a commute point of view, but I would go back, you know, to London and back in a day, weekly. I'd probably fly to Basel in Switzerland for a one, two hour meeting twice a week. Wow. Sorry, once every two weeks. Yeah. I'd say, you know, and that's, that takes its toll on you physically and it takes its toll on the environment yeah. and financially. Um, now, there's a balance though, Greg, because I, I obviously want to do as much meetings as possible via, you know, technology, but you cannot beat human interaction and chemistry. So my, my point of view on this is build relationships in person, maintain them with te technology. I like that. Yeah. And so that's um, that's the kind of hybrid thing you were uh, speaking about before, wasn't it? And, you know, you think when you were saying that what a lot of what Havas Links do, a lot of the work that you've done is for these huge conferences, medical conferences, where everyone comes together. Uh, what are you seeing there now? Are you seeing maybe half the capacity and some of the keynote speakers are coming to you live in the way that we're coming to each other now? Something like that. It's an interesting question and one I, I'll probably tread carefully in yeah, because... Okay. Um, the trend was everybody tried to recreate the the physical world virtually. And like, I, I tried to f put my foot on the ball and say, why are we doing that? Now, there's a time and a place for that. And we've done that for some clients. But this is a chance to answer to your question earlier. You know, what news is it? Don't try and recreate what's happened before or the new ways of doing it. 
So, for example, one of the pieces of work we, we had done that would have been a physical congress, we turned it into a voice assistant. So we're, we're talking about really busy oncologists that deal with cancer day in, day out. You know, it, there's a stat that they'd need to be awake 28 hours a day to keep up with developments in cancer, just to read and be up to date. Yet we're expecting them to travel around the world or to go on a website and give a couple of hours to, to take this new knowledge on. Our, our thinking with this was, why can't we have something that fits around their life rather than them fit around our life? And I hope this, you know, crisis, as we're calling it, helps us evaluate that, you know, put people first and, and really consider it, how we're communicating, who we're communicating and where we're communicating to them. I um, was particularly taken with uh, what you said about don't just try and do a uh, across the board replication of the previous world in the new world. Don't just try and make everything that was physical virtual. And, you know, from a musical perspective, and this is a really ham handed metaphor, but it sounded as if you were saying, don't just try and do a cover version of what we've already done. This is yeah. actually going to be new, a new paradigm and a new way of thinking. You know, this is, this is only my opinion, isn't it? Yeah. So, but like for, for me, we had to react quickly. It's all about being agile. So I understand completely why some people, some different agencies, different people have tackled it in, right, we need to recreate this. But when we have breathing space to really think about the true problem that we're trying to solve, what is it we're trying to achieve? This is what gets me excited. It's because, you know, a creative mind should be looking at what the real problem is, not what, how do I do what's been done before. And there's been so many great ideas in the past that actually COVID is... Is the blank page that I've been waiting for. Like, how do we use today's technologies and you know our new knowledge and data to to provide better services and, and you know look at new ways of doing things and adapt and evolve around the new world? That's interesting. And a lot of the having a gas discussions we've had this year, and as you, it, it will come as no surprise to you that that was a COVID development. You know, we need something to be doing to keep a meaningful relationship with our client base, but without just emailing, have you got any work? But well, we're doing this now. And that's, it's been my preferred way of having genuine conversations and a uh, long ramble. Where was I going with this? Oh yeah, the, the thing that permeated a lot of them was that we would be discussing COVID because it's been all anyone's spoken about all year. And I would try and steer away from it. But the, a distinction with you, because obviously have asked links is healthcare communications. Yeah. And so one question, and again, you know, all... NDAs and confidentiality do just you know say stop stop the ball uh, put your foot on the ball if we have to, uh, but do you do you guys get any early information or do you, are you in the loop with the medical community? Not not like this. Is a question we probably get asked all of the time, and people say are you busier, and people say not in correlation to COVID. But then the flip side of that is we work we have medical directors within our own agency, so we have you know super intelligent people that blow me away every day with their knowledge. So. In some senses, I'm more informed, but not through inside information by the, the intellect that I'm surrounded by. By your contact with the people who, you know, are the researchers who are at the forefront, but there's no, uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, so like if you like internal staff, like I said, we'll, we'll have, you know, doctors, we, we have people that are highly, you know, PhDs in medicine, they're, they're bright people that understand it more than a creative mind would or Joe Public. So from that sense, you know, I get a broader spectrum of what's going on. If you think, I think where you're going with this, so I imagine our clients that work in the big pharma that are probably looking at vaccines, they won't know 100%. You know, it's only, it, I'm sure, well, and again, I don't know enough to talk about this, but they would definitely not be sharing that with us. And it, it wouldn't be something we get, you know, a heads up on. Yeah, that's interesting, actually, that, um, that uh, the one of the things I was actually interested to in dis fencing with was the presumption that there's some kind of, what would you say, uh, not Illuminati, but, you know, there's a, a group of people who know stuff. And then, you know, I, loads of people were saying, oh, I, I bet Pfizer, they probably delayed that uh, announcement until X, Y, Z. And, you know, there's other people saying, I'm sure they got the info out as soon as they could. Um, if you're asking me if I can get you the vaccine early, Greg, the, the answer's I can't, sorry. I'm not asking that, and, <laughs> and I don't think I'm on the list of people who uh, would uh, be on the priority list. But... No, it's more to say that there are lots of people who were uh, highly sceptical about things and are, and you know there are people who aren't. And I suppose where I'm going with it is, uh, do you think we're going to see an uptick in healthcare communications about managing expectations and easing assurances about what's been at the front of everyone's mind for the last year? Um, 
I think we're going to see, I think we've already before COVID seen a, an uptake in wellness and health being a priority. So like at Lynx, when, when I first joined, we always compared ourselves creatively to we have to be as good or as better than consumer. What I found really interesting recently is we've gone from looking at consumers, consumer looking at us. Mm-hmm. Like wellness and health is at the forefront of conversation. And, and we're almost leading in the way because what I think everybody needs to do and will be doing, we've already been doing it. Um, you know, people focused, health focused, outcomes focused, quality of life. I think COVID has accelerated that. Um, do, if, you, if the part of your questions about COVID communications, I don't think we're any different to any other agency in that sense. Like it's political, we stay out of that. Mm-hmm. We represent our clients and the drugs that they ask us to. And at this moment, that's got nothing to do with COVID. On the flip side of that, we work on products that are immunosuppressant. So, you know, dampen the immune system. So we have to communicate with patients and make sure messages are getting out that we're being socially responsible to our patients. So COVID has affected our work, but maybe not in the way that outsiders would think, in a more responsible way that we've got, we deal with people with illnesses and products that help those illnesses that have a direct impact with what's going on in the world at the moment. So we've had to be responsible, but not in a way, you know, where we're talking about vaccines and anything there. The flip side of that, what we have been doing, we've done a great piece of work with our colleagues in, in the US and New York, where we've been, which we call behind the mask. And we've been doing a huge global research and insights piece where we're looking at how COVID is affecting healthcare communications, how they're affecting brands, how they're affecting people's actions. And we're bringing those insights to our patients and to our you know, colleagues in the network to make sure that we're dealing with and we have the right insights to react in the right way. So, you know, it's it, it's caused lots of new work streams in different ways, but never in the ways that my friends ask me or, or people presume. Yeah, and that is, uh, well, there's some questions that are formulating because I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's clear from who I'm talking, but I actually, I, I don't often prepare questions for these uh, and uh, just come up with it on the fly, mostly because... I don't. I don't want to have you say something and then me respond with not what you just said, but it's something I thought of earlier. So where am I going with this? What I'd like to do is I'd like to go into uh, rewind and go back to where you started and how you have progressed through uh, to where you are now as chief creative officer. I have asked links, and then you know I want to think about things that might be different, things that might have changed. But to contextualize that, I need to know when it was that you got in the game, and I'm not trying to find out your age. I'm 41. I'm not, you know, that's how old I am. Um, how do I get into advertising or, or are you talking links wise? Let's go creative first and then we'll go links. Yeah. It's good. It's actually a very different story, to be honest. Okay. So I always enjoyed being creative and it's probably similar to a few people where, you know, parents at home with the best will in the world was like, there's no, there's no money in being creative. I was also good at science and marketing and business studies. So um, didn't do any GCSEs and anything creative at all. Didn't do any A levels in it. I, you know, it was biology, business studies, and psychology. I actually went to university to do marketing, um, and I was doing marketing with business information systems, which actually makes me really laugh now when I look back. But there was this, and I didn't really enjoy it. What I did enjoy is going to the pub or to nightclubs or playing football, and I did enough to get by, and that was it. During that. Um, there was a module on advertising and I probably hadn't been to enough classes and I may have been told I need to pass this to stay in uni. I rocked up and got a first right. and it shocked quite a few people. And I was lucky enough that, you know, one of my lecturers took me to one side and said, you seem to have a natural sort of, and I found out a bit more about it. And in, in a strange way, the world looks after you. Um, there was a girl in my class whose boyfriend worked in the bar I worked in that was on the creative advertising course. We were both big Everton fans, but we'd never worked on the same shift. So I changed my shifts to work with him. And he did the thing that I've never seen anybody else do, but you hear cliche. He was literally drawing ads on napkins. Yeah. It was like, it was the called the graveyard shift. It was the bit in between people having a pint after work and then yeah. and people coming back out. It was nothing to do. And it was a great shift to be on, actually. So I started doing that with him. I rang the, um, the tutor up and said, I want to do this. And she just laughed at me down the phone. Um, so I had to do a foundation course, which I felt a bit humiliated. I'd gone from writing essays and studying to painting with a bloody broom or something like that, which I felt like was not, you know, university at all. 
But I was lucky enough to get on the, you know, the creative advertising course and I basically didn't look back. Um, I got a very good partner, a guy called, uh, creatives normally work in a creative partnership. I work with a really hardworking guy called Harinda Bajwa that I've got, you know, he goes by Harry, but I, I, I love what he had, the impact he had on my life and the, the work ethic he put in me. Um, and we just studied and fell in love with it. So we actually only had to go to class two days a week. We went every day. And when we weren't in class, we were reading DNADs page for page. Did you guys then split the labor? Was one of you copy, one of was art? Kind of should have been, but right. we were both both, um, which is a story in itself and probably helped me long run, but maybe not in the short term. Okay. I turned into a bit of a geek from someone that lived in a pub. I lived in a library. And I could have told you who made any ad, who like what, what one in which year. Like I really fell in love with the industry. Yeah. And I didn't from that day on until this present moment, I don't see it as a job. Right. I see it as who I am. I don't want to say vocation because it's not like a a moment or anything, but it it literally is. I live and breathe it because I enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um so you know, off the back of that, I was really proactive. We did we were at university, unfortunately, when September the eleventh happened. Oh, wow. And we were already told, you know, one of you may get a job too. It's really hard to get in. And although that was a sad event, it even motivated me even more. So I knew I had to do the extra million percent to get in. Uh, and I did, you know, and I had a placement in, in Euros in London when I was a second year. I hadn't actually finished university and they offered me and Harry a job. Um, and we didn't take it because we felt we owed our parents a degree show because uh, they'd help pay rent and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I've battled with that if that was the right or wrong decision um, for a long, you know, long time. We'll never know. Context to that: that my mum had a terminal illness, so I wanted us to have it for for a reason. Um, but then I'd had a book written with Cheatham Bell with Andy Cheatham, um, and I had a bit of a stunt with one of my. Um, with one of my projects that, that meant it left a post-it note behind. And I was actually in university in the third year. I had Harry in a headlock messing around and Andy Cheatham rang me up and said, there's a desk here if you want a, if you want a job. So I was one of the lucky few that actually had job offers before I'd left university. Wow. Um, but, it, you know, I say lucky. I spent all of my money, the, you know, getting on trains to London, showing my books to the best people that I admire. Um, I worked constantly. I did more than what anyone asked. You know, I knew every single person in town, both London and Manchester. I knew what work they'd done. And I wasn't taking no for an answer. Like I was going to be in advertising if it was the last thing that I did. And so right now, it sounds like you uh, ended up with one of the dream positions. I mean, yeah, I feel incredibly lucky because to give you context to this, while I was at JWT, I worked with, obviously Andy Cheatham helped me a lot, but I worked with... Tom Richards, that was our old CCO, and a guy called Pete Armstrong that helped me a lot. Um, and I think the biggest compliment you can have is Tom, every time Tom's moved to an agency, he's tried to poach me straight away. And I remember when he left BGL, which was the last agency I was at before um, Havis, it was like, it was a strange moment when he'd taken me to the chop house for a meal. And it was like, this is weird. It's like when you break up with a girlfriend. Yeah. And he was telling me that he was leaving, but he wanted me to join. And, you know, if anyone from Havis is listening, this is the truth, but don't be offended. I was like, there's no chance I'm coming. There's just none whatsoever. Why? Um, because I was a consumer. I was doing okay. I was picking up awards. I didn't want to work in healthcare. Um, yeah, that's it. When I spoke to uh, James at BBC Creative, he was like, uh, we didn't want the job at first because you only get to work for one client. It's not the same, but it's a similar way of thinking, yeah. isn't it? You know, James is someone I respect hugely, and he probably went through similar feelings to what I did. You know, there was two things that made me join Havis in the end. So I met a guy who was the old um, CCO, Dave Hunt, and he's probably one of the most inspiring people that I've met, right? He knew the company is huge, the offices are huge, he knew everyone's name, he knew all of the science, he knew all of the marketing, he knew all of the creative. He was so passionate and driven and you know, and, it, and his passion and drive comes from his motto, which is helpful change. And I, and I kind of bought into it, but I'd said to them, I've looked at the work you do and I, it's not me. It's not what I want to do. And his reply was, that's why we're talking to you. <laughs> like, we want you to do what you do here. And that was a, you know, massive compliment, but they stood by it. They allowed me to, and, and we have changed a lot. Like we've employed so many more consumer style thinkers and we, we've gone from being a digital agency that, 
did okay creatively and brilliantly at design to, you know, a Cannes Healthcare Agency of the Year. We were creatively and strategically very strong and probably envied um, within the world of healthcare. And, you know, if not, maybe within, you know, the shops in a hole in Manchester and London. So it was a, it was a long process. Um, but the decision that made me do it, if I'm being brutally honest, I had a self-reflection and it's, I didn't want to do it because I didn't know if I could do it. Yes. And I was like, so I'm scared of it. And the only way you can be to beat that fear is to go and tackle it head on. And it's the best decision I've ever made. I've not looked back since. Yeah, I'm so happy you said that because that is a recurring theme in life. And just, you know, with everyone is, you know, the thing that you need to do is the thing that you don't want to do. It's, you know, it's the thing that you're afraid of. That's where yeah. you're going to succeed. But there's so many cliches we could reel out, isn't it? Like nothing grows in shade, et cetera, et cetera. But I decided I can do consumer. My book, my book and my awards show that. We'll go and see if you can do something else. Yeah. And, uh, and honestly, it is literally the best decision I've made in life. Brilliant. And so, um, how long have you been at Have Ass Links? Five years. Five years. Okay. And so, um, one thing that I've... One thing that's interesting, you haven't been in healthcare for as long as you've been at Lynx. You know, you've, so you're on consumer side and, and retail side for a while. Um, and one thing I thought was interesting was that the general public have access to so much more information now than they used to. But I think that progression has been exponential, as in five years ago even, uh, Amazon wasn't the monolith that it now is, uh, share price-wise and, and operationally. So where am I going with this? Oh, yeah. How has... Uh, have you noticed a significant change in comms or in trying to get a message to the public when there is so much more potential for the public to, com you know, communicate with each other and, you know, spread different kinds of information or? I mean, y yes, but yes and no. Um, it's it's kind of like the world's changing all the time around us, but because we're in it, we're not always apparent to it. But of course, you know, technologies have changed and the way that we communicate has changed, the channels we choose. But I mean, for me, the, the best story is how we communicate so one of the missions that, you know, we've done at Links in healthcare is stop referring to them as patients and doctors, they're people. Yes. Right. And the next step in that journey is don't make it look like healthcare ads, like make it look like what they engage with. So our visual tone of voice, our narrative, our lexicons, we're changing all of the time. But the work we're producing now, it looks like their daily media. You know, Brilliant. if we're talking to a millennial, it looks and works and acts exactly like they do. It goes back to what I said about that Congress. It's about fitting around people, not getting people to fit around us. So we constantly have to evaluate because people are always changing. Our market needs, you know, competition, whatever it is in, in our environment, we need to bring it into our work. I love that as well, the way you framed that, saying that, we, you know, we're trying to get... Um... We're trying to get doctors and patients to decategorize themselves as people within the world of medicine, especially from the patient side of things. It sounds almost as if your creative mission is to try and make it so that when I'm old, we've gotten rid of that cliche of people not wanting to go and see the doctor. <laughs> you know, well, that's what we tackle day in day out. You know, there's a lot of stigma that comes with a lot of illnesses. We have, we have to tackle that. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of lack of knowledge. And there's a reason why there's a lack of knowledge because you don't want to Google something that you're going to be scared of. So you know. Anyone that works in the creative industry is lucky. It's a great career. It's, it's rewarding as it, as, as it can be frustrating, but it, that's, you know, part of the passion of it. But when we, what we do at links, you just get that extra value because it, it's got an impact on the way someone lives their life. Um, you can genuinely change someone's life with something that you've thought of. There's been ideas that, that we've won big awards with. The awards don't matter as much when you realise that that thinking, that innovative approach has actually really improved someone's life, many people's lives, that you've looked at something so differently, you've solved the problem for good. And that's, you know, there isn't a piece of metal or glass or whatever trophy you want that is as rewarding as that. You know, what's brilliant is that a, a theme that comes up quite a lot in this series is social purpose marketing, which uh, may be unfairly of me, but I, in a kind of cynical way, I view that as... Um, People who serve capitalism with a guilty conscience, not that I think you need a guilty conscience for that, uh, trying to make amends for that, find some atonement. We're actually changing the world in a positive way as well as trying to shift an extra million units. But it sounds like with wellness and healthcare comms, you actually get the reward that you are making a positive difference. 
and you don't need to look elsewhere for it. No, no, we do. But I think it's important to be transparent and honest because when we, we were interviewing people, they'll come and they'll say, you know, I've come to you guys because I want to do... We still sell drugs. Yeah. And I'm very, very comfortable with that um, because we need to sell drugs so that the research and development can go and get vaccines for COVID. Because without those profitable big pharma, we wouldn't have the hope that we've got now. Yes. So there's a balance. And it was the same when I worked in consumer. I have never had any guilt about selling products. In fact, I'm proud of it because all we do is the message. We make people know they're there and make people aware of it and maybe change their mind or the behavior. But we, I, I believe in consumerism and competitiveness and it's how we improve in some ways. It's how we get better products. It's how we get a better lifestyles. But what we need to do is have the balance that it's not at expense of the environment or social responsibility or, or people. Um, and a lot of the work that we do, that we can talk about and that we share in healthcare is changing perceptions. We do a lot of disease awareness or market shaping. So there'll be a new product coming out and we can't talk outside of America directly to a patient anyway. You can only talk to the HCPs. So what we tend to do is show the need for it or the awareness of it or what needs to change. And that's where it's really rewarding because a lot of the clients that we work with the, you know, pharma can sometimes come with a certain reputation. They're spending millions of pounds in an area of rare diseases where there's no there's no profit in it, apart from, you know, saving. It. There is profit in it, but not what people think. Yeah. I mean, that, that and, and that, you have to look at it holistically. So, you know, there's one pot of money to help everybody. So you need to, you, you need to make sure that those drugs perform. You need to make sure that we communicate and sell them in a certain way so that they can put that money back into research and development so that they can have, we, we can all live better lives as we get older. You know, I think we're lucky that the age we're living in, in, in healthcare, that, you know, it's opened its eyes to creativity and the importance of it. Yeah. So that's, you know, a great place to be for myself. But also we're at a huge advancement of science. So there's a lot to talk about. And if you bring into the mix, people are living longer. So, you know, that's a you know, moulding pot of loads of interesting things for an advertising agency that works in the industry. Yes. And uh, I thought, and you know, that one thing that really struck a chord with me was you were saying that we need to shift drugs in order to have the R&D budget to make sure we have something ready for this crisis moment. And that always, um, that struck me a lot this year that, um, a good deal of things have been inverted. So, um, I'll yeah. One obvious one is uh, any public mm, distaste for big pharma has some, turned into you know desperation for big pharma to work on our behalf. But then more broadly, a number of other things like there was a widespread movement, fairly enough, to uh, remove single-use plastics and then a mass call out for PPE. All, you know, we need disposable PPE, disposable plastic. So it's interesting how crises turn things on their head in that way. And of course, those are the environments when you need creativity because all the old solutions don't work. It's perspective, isn't it? And I mean, I would love for us to give cancer drugs away to people. I, I really would. And so would everyone I work with. You know, if anyone's got anyone in their family that they, they care about, that's ill, then they deserve the best possible treatment. But if we stop and think about that, to get the best possible treatment, you need the best possible minds, the best, you know, that have been through university. Those people have to pay their mortgages. Yeah. They need to, that, you know, the job industry, forget pharma, the job industry for those minds is competitive. Yes. So, you know, this is where it comes into, but at links, we have this belief of good business and pharma, and in the middle of that Venn diagram is, is good pharma, and that's the type of brands we work with, that's the type of culture we, we build, and there's the balance of it, and we generally believe in it, and, and I can see it day in, day out. That's great. Um, and there's... I, what, what, what I often find with this with the series is every, talk, every talking point we come across could turn into a number of hours and uh you know there's always there's always other things i want to cover so one thing i wanted to get into was i didn't know until having this conversation that you were a uh devout follower of the industry and you know very uh passionately uh committed to you know the the dna d the brilliant world of you know the creative stuff that we're into so i wanted to know what who you found 
uh, influential? Who inspired you? Or what, you know, what great work really comes to mind when you think of you know, stuff that made you excited to be in this industry? It's a good question. So like my, uh, we need heroes and role models, don't we? Paul, Paul Belford was, was, um, was my poster boy, you know, amazing at what he did. Still is. Um, loved his approach. A big influence on me was I was very lucky that my first placement I was talking about before, it was a guy called Nigel Rose, who's quite a established art director that took us under his wing and, and helped us out a lot. Um, there's so many of them, you know, Dave Drober, uh, still to this day, you, you know, we, we've got a new global creative chief creative officer, Icaro. You know, when I'm looking through the work that he's done, you're thinking, wow, like I thought I'm nowhere near as good as I thought I was. So yeah. it's great that people out there that stay humble. But to be dead honest, and this is going to sound such bullshit, but my juniors, right, are my heroes now and my inspiration because I, I, I've always believed this, but never more than I do at the moment. It's really good to have your eye over your shoulder, right, and to, to bring that new energy into the industry and to see their enthusiasm and to keep yourself on the toes Worst thing a crave can be is is comfortable. Yeah, complacent. Yeah, yeah. And I love you know the energy and passion of some of our juniors that we're bringing through the agency and, and what they bring to the table. And, and I believe you can learn from everybody. Like I don't take creative inspiration just from creatives. Um, and I found it interesting your point that you know you didn't think that you know I'd study the NAD and be that you're a creative through and through. The the part of the industry I work in to me is just the problem that I'm solving. I think I can speak on behalf of many great, we're just problem solvers and we get off on it. You know, give me a blank pad and in a few hours I'll come back with a solution for you. And, and that's what it's about. It's that challenge. And I love admiring other people's work and how they've done it. I don't watch adverts like the rest of the world does, and, you know, and just enjoy them. I deconstruct them. Yes. I look at them and think, I wonder what the brief was. Yes. I wonder how they've approached it. And I, it still to this day gives me pleasure. Yeah. Is there any, uh, do you keep your eye on the scene uh, on, you know, what's going on in London, New York, et cetera? Yeah, as much as humanly possible. Nowhere near as much as I did before I took a senior role. Yes, of course. My, my mornings used to consist of when I was just a creative, would, you know, sit at your desk, get your coffee, and I'd go in inspiration sites and I'd look at that and I would do that for the first hour of every day and I would give my right arm to still be able to do that. So what's, what's different now, your chief creative? What's the, what's the schedule? <laughs> Um, schedule is open your laptop it fires a million emails at you that's gone on through the night um, you look at your diary there isn't even time to have lunch at the moment uh, so it's just Mad. it's bit, it's really good I say that like flippantly it, I get off on it I like being busy I like driving forward but my diary is constantly full sometimes it's triple booked I was really embarrassed that I needed a PA but she's been brilliant and makes me more efficient but there isn't, you know, if I have spare time, I want to be being a creative. Um, and obviously I have many hats I have to wear as a CCO. Yeah, it's always uh, something to keep in mind, especially um, when talking to the, uh, you know, either younger people who are yet to start their career or people who are just new entrants to the career ladder. Uh, it's get comfortable with the fact that the more senior you get, the more constrained your life will become and you know, your free time will be, extraordinarily uh, in short supply, let's say, especially if, I don't know if you have a family, but if you've got a family, then that's another, uh, you know, a senior role to occupy, isn't it? So, Yeah, I mean, I found it, that, that sort of last point, I don't have a family yet. It's me, my girlfriend, and my dog, and I've found there's probably this, the minute part of COVID that have been a little bit lucky. So, like, I'm managing people that are juggling childcare, that are juggling... We've been incredibly busy, not because of COVID, because the way that we work and the success rate and it's pitch season at the moment. And you have to be conscious all of the time that people are going through different experiences. They are juggling children at home. Um, you know, and I say how hard my day is and I've got it easy compared to a lot of people in that sense, you know. The worst thing I've had is my dog needing to go to the toilet while I'm on a Zoom call for playing. Yeah. You know, but we can all get over that. Um so it, it is really hard, but I, I think with anything in life, like you can make yourself less busy or more busy depending on your passion levels. Like my, my little sister's a primary school teacher and she works unbelievable hours because she cares about her kids. Where, the, you know, not I'm not saying there's a lot of teachers out there like this, but some of them will mark the work with the kids in the day. So it's 
it's the passion you want to put in. And, and I'm still very much in, you get out what you put in. So I'm going to put every, you know, I feel incredibly lucky to be where I am in the job that I'm in, with, within the culture that I'm in and the people I'm around. I, I'm still in the mind that I'm going to do everything I can to make that as good as I can for everybody. So maybe I'm guilty of making myself busier than I need to be. I think that that can happen to to a lot of us, but it's certainly um, something I'm afraid of. You know, we're getting busier, and as you know, as our company continues to grow, um, you know, I, I spoke to um, Parva at Wave Studios just over a few texts recently, and um, uh, and he was saying because uh, we're going to do one of these, and he was saying, "Great, but we're going to have to push it back a couple of months because I'm just knee deep in work till about nine p.m. every day at the moment." So. Um, that's the, the, you know, the thing to keep in mind, especially we're a music business and we like, you know, making our own music in our own time. And you just know that when the time comes, uh, when it's six day weeks or seven day weeks, you know, those opportunities will be fewer and further between. So it's get, get your, uh, get your, get your side hustles in before you get to the chief creative position, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying there isn't those opportunities there, but like to still do your own thing, but is it at the expense of where I can be helping develop other people or, you know, making sure that the work is how it needs to be for our clients and for our, you know, for ourselves too. But it, it, I, I, I think any creative will be saying and thinking the same. You just want more time always. We're perfectionists. Is there a better idea out there? If I had more time, I could craft it better. You know, with you guys and music, you know, I like, I love every time we've worked together and what you've given us, but it's like, let, have I thought about it right? Could the brief be better? Could but you've got a certain amount of time to do it in, and yeah. it, it's because we're passionate about what we do. We're perfectionists. Yes. But there's that balance as you get older and mature of knowing that you've got to get onto the next job, or there's something else you've got to consider. So getting it right quicker is a skill you develop as you as you grow. I think. Yeah. And so um, one last uh, thing I wanted to clear because we're, we're you know coming up on 45 minutes already, and it does go quick. Um, was uh, we've not talked about any music yet. And so, you know, I wanted to get a, uh, uh, put the feelers out for, you know, are you a music person? Do you listen to music much in your own time? Does it not play a part in your life at all? Music's one of my biggest passions there is. Um, I, I always have, and I love it. As a, as a boy, I'd lie in my room and listen to music rather than watch telly. Great. As an adult, I do exactly the same. Um, I have a compromise with my girlfriend that it's Friday night. I don't let the telly's off and we drink and listen to music the rest of the days. Perfect. I let her watch her shows. But um, what the question I fear that may come, I can't answer, is like, what music do I listen to? Because I'm the biggest fan of Spotify in the world. Yeah. And, and I'm guilty, as the same as how I work, of exploring rather than enjoying. Yeah. So I, I go through loopholes and loopholes and I'm always trying to discover new um, I have a playlist that's called PK2014 and you could listen to it for about a two months solid. So I dump into that playlist nonstop when I'm finding new stuff and then, I, you know, I'll, I'll play it on on repeat and, or I have to put it on mix, but I'm never away from music. Um, weirdly, though, working at home, I'm listening to less. So my commute used to be a headphones in, be thinking... There'd be times where it worked to block out the office environment, headphones would be in. Yeah. Um, what's happened with, with COVID and working from home, I'm not having the face-to-face -face conversations and they're not as organic, so they're booked in one after the other and team calls. So I don't actually have that luxury of having music on. Um, my Friday nights are talking about with music. One of my, this is incredibly sad, so apologise for all the creatives that will cringe. My favourite thing to do is like, we'll, we'll spend time together as a couple I maybe drink a little bit more than she does. So she'll go and, you know, have a bath or go to bed. I get my layout pad out and that's my time where I become a creative and not a manager or yeah. an admin man or a HR personnel. And I'm, you know, I've had a drink. I've got my favorite music on. I'm really relaxed. It's just myself. I make sure the dog's gone upstairs with, with Robin. Um, and it's amazing what it does. It takes me to a place where the ideas are. And is it, you know, I joke with like, and I, it, it wasn't me that said this. I can't remember it was, but I, I, you know, I write drunk and edit sober, <laughs> and I really look forward to. If we're busy, I need that Friday night where I can. I almost class it as cheating because yeah. I look back at the work the next day and I go, "Who did that?" Type yeah. thing. <laughs> it's 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 still a, it's a hobby. Like I said, it's a hobby, not a job. Sometimes. Yeah, no, that did that. Is, that is an idyllic picture right there, and so. Um, 
So yeah, uh, it's good to know we're in good company. I don't, are you a vinyl guy or is it all Spotify? Spotify, Spotify and Sonos. I love the, yeah. you know, the smart. I'm, I'm a, I'm a walking cliche, but the fact you know, smart tech and all of that, I'm really into. So I love the fact I can go from room to room and whatever I'm listening to follows you around. Comes with me. Yeah, brilliant. Well. Um, what was the one there was one thing flying through my mind oh yeah that was it can you send us a link over to PK2014 and we'll put it in the description I can indeed yeah but um, on one condition you listen to it backwards okay like Tenet (laughs) yeah it's because it's you know from the the last thing I put in you flip it because yeah I think the first song in there is Casio Kids and when you listen to it it's really interesting to see how my music taste has developed as I've, I've I've maybe chilled out a little bit as I've got older. But yeah. yeah happy. I'd be interested to see that progression. Well, uh, it's been uh, a good chat and I'm grateful that you, uh, you know, you came on. And so uh, we'll go after John Chapman next and we'll see if, uh, you know, we can get any of his uh, embarrassing music taste out. I think you were quite well guarded there. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you, you have a listen. John's a bit of a rock fan, I think. But yeah, good guy. Looking forward to uh, chatting with him. <laughs> it's been a pleasure though. And I think this is a great idea. It's important that as an industry, we're supporting each other, communicating and keeping the spirits up. So thank you for having me on.